Hey guys, it's Tuesday night. Guess who I got in the house? I got number 86. I got Bresnahan from Cumming, Georgia. How you doing tonight, Ben? Good to see you, bud. Yes, sir. I'm doing great tonight, Bernard. Thanks sure so much you know, for having me on, on tonight. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. And guys, this Ben is has the uh, distinction of being the first tw Team 2 member uh, who's been on the, the program. We've had some other young guys on, but we got Team 2, number 86, in the house, he's getting ready for the NFL draft, and we're going to get into a whole bunch of good stuff. Ben, tell us a little bit. I know you're getting ready for the draft coming up in a couple of months, but where are you in schooling? Where are you in in prep? I know you're still in Nashville, but catch us up a little bit, and then we're gonna we're gonna jump back into the days of you start starring at West Forsyth in a few minutes. All right, sounds great. Yeah, so currently, um, as you said, I'm preparing for the NFL draft. Um, I'm also doing another semester of my graduate program. Um, I'm just locally here in Nashville uh, and training over at a facility here in Nashville over in um, kind of Westmead area. Um, and then luckily just knocking that out every single day in the morning and then have my class at night. Um, I'm in the leadership and organizational performance um, program and at Peabody. And I have this semester um, and then I have one more fall in the semester. So hopefully finishing that up next spring after the NFL season this fall. So, man, this that's the definition of a Vandy man right there. Getting his not just his degree, but his second degree, prepping for the NFL draft, and was just an all-around team leader and captain this past year for team two. Ben, before we jump back to when you were a nine-year-old wannabe, we're going to talk about this past year real quick. Mm -hmm. Coach Lee has built a culture that we've never seen in Vanderbilt football. And he does such a it, it's as if not a single thing that he does is by accident. So take us inside that clubhouse, take us inside team two and share a little bit about what you want to share about how he has brought, because we, we had, as you know, transitioning from the Mason era to the Lee era, the cupboard was pretty bare. You could have easily have, have left like many did, but we also, this past year, Ben, there was a, a uh, a stat that came out that we had the least to transfer into the portal and we also brought in the least comparing SEC schools. Just share a little bit if you would from an insider's perspective about Coach Lee and the culture that he's building and now with Team 3 on board. Mm -hmm, for sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, I love Coach Lee and his whole entire staff and have really enjoyed that transition. Obviously there was a lot of question marks whenever after Mason left and Coach Lee came in. And I think just one of the biggest pieces is like the, how our program is centered around uh, accountability is huge. Uh, one of the things that's always stuck out to me that Coach Lee has mentioned, um, I think through team one to team two, is like kind of how he treats program as like a horizontal total pole in terms of having, you know, whenever somebody wants to speak up and thinks that we're doing something or something that can be improved, that it's your right and your responsibility to speak up. And that also goes to, you know, how we really have a um, program kind of pyramid. And one of the big pieces of that is our covenants. And that's with dealing with brotherhood, dealing with accountability, dealing with pride in everything we do. And that accountability piece is huge. And that's from player to player, coach to coach, coach to player, and just throughout the whole entire building and just trying to get to our highest level in every single aspect of our, you know, our, our everyday football and off the field and classroom and everything. Ben, Coach Lustig a few weeks ago was on the show, and he spoke very highly of you, and I know you guys think well of each other. He also talked about the covenants and that how important that is, peer-to-peer, -peer, coach to peer, et cetera. And that's not an easy thing to, to install in a culture, in a team that is not your team when you begin with. Mm -hmm. Coach Lee is now in his going on his third season. I know he calls him team one, two three, and I know you're not part of team three, but you, with your last season as a, a playing in team two, what is it that you see that you all have built that now team three can then go from what you've built and take it to the next level for them? You know, I think just um, it comes down, like, like I mentioned, the accountability piece, but I think just from what I saw from um, you know, our two seasons ago, whenever we were two and 10, and to last season, whenever we were five and seven, it was those close games. And, you know, maybe they come out and team scores on their first drive. And maybe I'd say two years ago, that we'd be like, oh, shoot, like, then get down on ourselves. But then I think into last year, 
it's like, all right, whatever, we're going to control what we can control. And we're going to go out and, you know, just to our best every single snap because every snap matters. And we never thought that we were out of the fight. And that's what I thought was huge jump from year one, team one to team two. Um, and just knowing that and just being consistent in our approach to, you know, we're in every single game. So we just got to keep fighting, keep in the battle and keep pushing. You know, I was there at the East Tennessee game lat two seasons ago. And I watched almost every single game, every play this past year to see the difference in the body language from that game to this season, particularly the Florida game. What a huge difference from an outsider's perspective. There's a picture, I don't know if you've seen it, maybe you have, at the Kentucky game, there are eight defenders making a tackle on one player. And that just shows to me in a snapshot how different the team mentality is on the field. But that's gotta be built off the field and it's that grind that no one wants to ever admit they enjoy but I have a feeling you kind of enjoy that a little bit <laughs> so take us into that offseason Aaron what are the guys doing right now um so from what I've heard I mean offseason I do definitely enjoy the grind of the offseason <laughs> there's some days when I wake tight up. ends are built that way <laughs> <laughs> hello yeah uh, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, Coach Horgan does a great, great job with the guys in the offseason, getting them ready, both physically and also Kayleen on the mental performance side of things, getting us mentally prepared and just really taking advantage of every single resource we have in that building is huge. And I think, you know, as well from team one to team two, I think guys were just in the building a bunch more and they were just, you know, consistently showing up to find extra work, extra film, extra recovery, whatever that looked like. Um, whereas, you know, maybe earlier on there was, some areas where um, kind of found maybe the soft spaces a little bit and, you know, um, found those areas, but now it's like, you know, you got to be uncomfortable to grow. And there's a lot of guys um, from top to bottom who are really trying to, you know, just find that extra, extra inch to keep, like, keep growing, keep. Um, and that's a great time in off season to keep every single day, getting that extra 1% better each day. And I think, like I said, coach Horgan, everybody on staff, but obviously strength coach, that staff and his staff are the big guys who, are really with them every single day um, in the spring or in the off season training program. So I really think that's been great. And I know I've heard at least from, you know, I'm not a part of team three, but I still get, you know, updates here and there. Uh, and I think they have some really, really cool stuff, both mentally and physically taxing stuff um, so far this spring. Uh, and I'm really excited to have that, you know, translate into now getting into the spring ball here. I think, I mean, they're early, I think they're earlier this week. I hate referring to like there, but I'm like, I'm not a part of like the last five years have been like us, but now it's like, uh, they're, they're preparing now. But um, so I think they're a week earlier now for spring ball. So they're, I'm excited to get out for a couple of those practices, get out for spring game and really support the boys there and see how much they've grown this, this uh, off season. Well, Ben, I, I know you're, as you're preparing for the NFL draft, it's okay to admit you miss it a little bit. You miss the team. That's okay. A little bit. I mean, hey, <laughs> I, I saw my too. sixth year. I saw my COVID year. So I could have come back from my, That's right. would have been the old. That's right. Well, Ben, we got we got some Commodores who've rolled in. Guys, I've got number 86, Ben Bresnahan. We got Gabe Banks in the house. We got Billy Smith, one of the beloved Keystone cops. We got TR St. Charles. And oh, they came, they went too quick. I got two or three more, Ben. They've already rolled through, but as they come in, I'll let you know. Ben, let's talk about the when you came in in, in the fall of, of 18, the I'm gonna call it the level of athleticism has just, to me, has just gone up every single year. And it was so clear. I, I keep going back to that Florida game for a purpose because I know you caught a big touchdown past that game. You know, those are the kind of games that in the last five to ten years we haven't been as competitive. But you guys put together two just excellent games, the, obviously Kentucky and, and Florida. But I want you to take us to the Florida game, a 31-24, to 24, if I remember correctly, win. You get a big touchdown. There's a lot of big plays. But from an athleticism standpoint, as far as I'm concerned, I didn't see any difference in the in the level of athleticism on either side of the ball. You guys just happened to play seven points better that game. What kind of confidence do you have going into all of those games when you know from an athletic standpoint, you guys are equally as, as athletic, if not better, in many parts of the game? Talk about, I guess what I want to talk about is that that confidence as an athlete who's competing, how important that is. 
definitely is. That confidence is like huge. And um, it's definitely tough whenever maybe you've had a couple of losses and you're still, you know, trying to keep that confidence and just knowing and trusting the process and that preparation is where that confidence really comes from. And that's what I really enjoyed just throughout, I mean, the whole entire year, but during the season, you know, I really like how Coach Lee, um, a chain, I mean, we track, so with our catapults that we use, it's our tracking devices that we always wear for workouts, practices. Um, and it's like kind of a bra that we track uh, speed and work output. And what I really enjoyed was that whenever um, Coach Lee in meetings would put up on the board and see how our speeds have changed from uh, team one to team two, and just how much faster and how much, how many more guys are above the 18, 19, 20 range. Um, and that's been huge. And obviously Mike helped out with running 21, 22 miles an hour too. I wish I could feel what that felt like, but, um, <laughs> but uh, that is, it was just very eye opening to see kind of where we were at a year ago. And now late into the season against Florida, we were still had X amount of guys over 18 miles an hour. And that was, you know, through the later, later games in the, in the year, whenever guys were supposed to be sore, but I mean, we're taking, more seriously the recovery throughout the season and just really getting our bodies primed for each week. Well, speaking of 21, 22 miles an hour, I know who did feel that the entire Hawaii sidelines when Mike went 87 yards, I want to, I want to take you to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. What was, you know, Hawaii is paradise for most of us. Hawaii is paradise for, for everyone, except you guys were there for really a business trip. You know, mm -hmm. at the end of the week, you had a ball game, you had to compete. But earlier in the week, you guys get out there, but you've got a lot of service projects. You still got to run through your, your practice for the week. Was this a week you guys had circled on the calendar for a long time and were looking forward to it? Or was there some mixed emotions? Take us, let's say that was August of last year. Take us to this time last year. Was it starting to percolate on the, on the minds of guys that, hey, we're going to Hawaii in, in August to jump off this season? Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, funny, even before that day, really, and whenever I enrolled, I looked at the schedule for a couple of years out. I was like, oh, if I'm still here for my fifth year, I'll be going to Hawaii. So that was a, a nice. big goal. And I was like, oh, wait, I'm here now. Jeez, that flew by. Um, so that was, yeah, I mean, I think some guys, especially uh, some of the younger guys, too, were like, oh, sweet, like first year. And now we're going to Hawaii first game. It was a very cool experience. And I think once, like, through camp, it was a, great way obviously camp is always a grind and just trying to make the most out of it and getting everything you know tightened down um and being able to kind of at the end of camp be able to go out to Hawaii was a pretty great experience and I think um our staff coaching staff and just each part of our staff really um did a great job of kind of setting up the schedule where it was a great balance of being able to experience you know Hawaiian culture um as well as we were able to go to Pearl Harbor and see, you know, everything there, which is just breathtaking. Um, and then we were also able to have like um, some downtime too, to really to ourselves to be able to go to a little beach day, but not get sunburned. So it wasn't too much on the pads whenever we were in the game. Um, <laughs> but I think it was most like, like I said, the accountability, it was, we were really like with each other and really holding each other accountable to be like, let's have fun. Like, I feel like it was being present in the moment. It was the biggest thing. So really enjoy, you know, Hawaii as much as you can, but also knowing that we are here for a business trip and getting our work in each day and, you know, tightening down every single piece of our game plan. And I, I think our all of our guys did a really great job with both enjoying the what felt like a bowl week where you were able to really experience the island and, um, you know, enjoy every single aspect of that, but also be able to, you know, know why we're out there. It's for to play football and to play, try to play at our highest level that week. And, you know, I think we did a really great job. Well, I was going to say, uh, even though they jumped out to that quick touchdown, you guys kind of turned it around and turned on the burners. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's too bad you you didn't take your sixth year. You're not going to Vegas as team three member, but that's, that's okay. It's a trade-off. I don't know. I saw it. Maybe I'll get picked up by the Raiders. We'll see. I'll see the boys out there. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Well, the last thing I want to ask about Hawaii, you guys get back from the big win. You're going over game play. I don't know if you did it Sunday or Monday when you got back, but the play I referred to earlier where I, I guess maybe it was Shepard that had the awesome crack block, but I want you to take us into that tight end room when there was that Michael or type block, the kick out block by Gavin that took the dude. He may still be somewhere in mid Honolulu on that. You got You got to talk to us about that. Cause I know you ran that back about 15 times when you're watching it. 
that that was a fun meeting for sure. And you know, like you said, you talked with Coach Stig the other day, and he's big personality, great guy, one of my favorite guys. And you know, it was fun to go through that film because we really pride ourselves on you know getting knockdown blocks um, and really getting those finishing blocks out of bounds. You know, guys to the ground. Um, and we track those things. So whenever we saw Gavin in that meeting and it was like going throughout the whole film was like, oh, knock down here, knock down here, my catch here. So that was a lot of fun. And seeing Gavin, I think, I don't know if you look closely at it, but I'm pretty sure he looked back at uh, Coach Stig on the sideline after he did it because he already knew Mike was gone, no was catching him. So he looked back at Stig and started sprinting down the field. So that was a pretty, pretty amazing moment for the boys. Yeah, by the time he looked up, Mike was probably 60 yards down the field. <laughs> yeah. He was on that block for so long. Mm. but. Ben, let's step back a little bit before you you left coming. When you're growing up as a kid, you're multi-sports like most guys are who end up playing the next levels. Uh, I know baseball was always big in, in your world, and at some point you had wanted to play baseball in college. We'll get to that in a minute as well. But what, what sports really held your attention, middle school or junior high, whatever y'all called it, and into high school? And – when did Vanderbilt kind of show up on your radar as a potential landing spot for you? Yeah. So from a young age, I feel like my main two are really um, baseball and basketball. I don't know my main two. Mm-hmm. And then I actually played flag football back in the day in like a church league when I was young. I didn't play the peewee, peewee football. So I saved a couple of hits on the head when I was young. That was nice. Um, <laughs> but then really in the middle school, I played the three baseball, basketball, football, um, started playing football in my fifth grade year right before I got to middle school and I really enjoyed it but I think baseball was still always my kind of number one my passion what I really loved um and then it helped me in basketball because I wasn't shooting any threes but I definitely grew up a little bit more than the guys earlier on so I was able to get a lot of rebounds make my shots from you know the free throw line whenever I needed to and around but um and I guess through high school that's whenever uh my freshman year um in the sophomore year I was playing baseball I stopped playing basketball but then I did football uh, and then my sophomore year I came up to Vandy for a baseball camp uh, so actually that was my like I said that was my first love was the baseball for sure and uh you know oh, I, wait this would have been in 15 mm-hmm, uh 15 yep yeah mm-hmm. so they had just lost no they had just they had just won no they, they won it in 14, 14 and lost it in 15 but uh, both against Virginia so you're you're in there now. You got to remember who were some of the guys you were in camp with, who maybe ended up at Vanderbilt on the Vandy boys team. Were there any of those guys? Uh, I don't have this. I don't remember any specifics there. I do remember I always was a big fan of Dan's BB and from Atlanta um, as well. So played in the same area for baseball, same kind of travel circuit there. So I was definitely a big fan of him. Um, and then obviously Corbin, like I only heard good things about him and was really excited to meet him and. Um, you know, even on my Instagram, I think I still have a picture. If you score way, way down, like there's me a picture of me and Corbs down there at the baseball camp when I was probably weighing it. And, and what I was gonna say, what, how tall and what, what size were you then? <laughs> yeah, I was probably. I mean, I graduated high school at like two twenty two, so I was probably sophomore year, maybe around like two hundred. And right, I mean, I was about six two, six three, and yeah. got an inch, inch and a half in a in high school later on so uh, <laughs> but yeah it was definitely definitely not the starting SEC tight end size at the moment whenever I was a sophomore in high school but <laughs> we got there um, so yeah and then from there I kind of just there was this moment for me when I it just kind of started shifting to those Friday night lights just the whole football atmosphere and like just the game really I just kind of started to fall in love more with that through my high school career um, so then I kind of started to drift away a little bit from baseball and focus my attention to football. Um, And that was, what was that now? My junior year was whenever I first got my first football offer. um, And that was to Wake Forest. And then kind of throughout the next season, I was whenever a lot of the offers started to, you know, come in. Um, And that's, I mean, it was just a a lot as a high schooler. I didn't even have to deal with all the NIL stuff, you know, like talk now. So it was at least a little simpler back then. but yeah, I mean, it was it was definitely just an enjoyable process, and I have a great support system too back at home um, with my mom and dad and sister and close family. So, well, by the time you were a, a junior going into senior year, was football really the sport for you? Had baseball kind of gone by the wayside, or were you still playing baseball? 
Um, it fell by, yeah, fell a little bit by the wayside. I kind of put my, a lot of my attention into the football and going all out and that my junior, senior year, um, and then stopped playing baseball my sophomore year after that year, actually. Yeah. In addition to Wake Forest and then later Vanderbilt, what other schools had shown some real interest in you? Uh, yeah. So a couple other SEC was like, um, what was it? It was Ole Miss, Kentucky, um, Tennessee, um, and then Wake Forest, NC State were a couple other. NC State, Duke was another one. Um, so a couple of those are kind of like my main few that I was really looking at. So well, I guess you you were you predated uh, Georgia's uh, concentration on tight ends. I'm like you're in the backyard of Athens. I'm surprised you didn't uh, get a look there as as well. I know it was yeah it was like a little full circle moment too because it was uh, at the time Beamer Coach Beamer uh, he was at Georgia Georgia tight ends coach so he would come out to my practices every once in a while and uh, then full circle was this past year whenever I was down at Media Days in Atlanta and he was obviously head coach now in South Carolina and we were in the same holding room I was like full circle man so it was it was pretty cool but that is pretty cool guys I've got number eighty six Ben Bresnahan. He's prepping for the NFL draft in a couple of months, and we're just talking about his his maturation through coming Georgia, West Forsyth. And when did you first visit Vanderbilt as a, a recruit or a potential uh, maybe on a recruiting visit for football? And uh, what were your impressions? Because I know Coach Mason was, was the coach at that time, um, but what was that like? Yeah, I came up uh, – what was that? I had a – couple of visits and I think I ended up committing the summer and going to my senior year. So that would have been summer 2017. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, I really enjoyed it. I was able to, you know, talk with um, whenever at the time it was Pinkney, Jared Pinkney, Cody Markell and uh, mm -hmm. Shermer, Kyle Shermer were all on my visit when I was uh, visiting with my parents and it was just really great to sit down with them. Um, and actually shout out to Sherm too. He just got married last weekend. I was well. going to say, I saw that. some photos. Yeah, saw Very some cool. photos. Sadly, didn't get the invite. So good, bro. Um, <laughs> ne neither did I. So you know, it's fine. <laughs> um, hopefully, he's on this call. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I mean, I really think I did enjoy, and I, Mason was always great. You know, players coach, and he had a great relationship with his guys. Um, and at that time, it was Ludwig, um, who was now at Utah, but he loved tight ends. So that was you know great. And, a big um, reason why I ended up coming to Vandy as well as, you know, I always wanted to go to a great academic school as well as giving myself, you know, the option to play at the next level after college too. Um, and I felt like Vandy was the best option for me. And so, yeah. Well, Ben, I want to, I want to kind of shift gears for a minute or two and, and the, what, from, from our standpoint, when I say are the old heads, the guys who've been long gone, transferring was a much more difficult Thing, particularly in conference you mm -hmm. rarely saw that you had to get permission from the ad or head coach it was a real um, undertaking but the transfer portal obviously has changed all of that in the last couple of years mm -hmm. name image and likeness that's it's the wild west yeah. and and until either congress steps in or somebody gets a hold of the ncaa and gives them some real teeth it's still going to be the Wild West. But from your standpoint, did it impact negatively or positively your decision to keep at Vanderbilt, to keep doing what you're doing? Does it influence a lot of guys and women too? Because obviously it's all sports. And I'm sure you have friends on other in other teams at Vanderbilt. How often, I guess my question to start with, Ben, how often is that a topic of conversation on a day-to-day -day basis, transfer portal or name, image, and likeness issues? Yeah, I think um, it definitely is just such a new realm. And, you know, it was in my junior year whenever I started up. And mm -hmm. at first I was like, you know, this is a great opportunity um, for us athletes. Mm -hmm. And then I also thought about how I didn't want guys to being – just showing all this money and then lose focus on football and just worry about like, you know, the wrong things, you know, it's great whenever you're grinding at your craft and excelling in that. And that's how that shows up. But it's another thing whenever it's these guys coming to high school, which is tough now where they're projected so high, they have so many X amount of followers on 
any social media platforms and now they're getting money out of high school. So it's like, are you going to be able to have that consistent grind? And even though you already have X amount in your bank account. And um, so I think that's definitely something to look at or just, you know, be interested in. Um, but I think for at least in our locker room, um, it was, I mean, I think like a lot of the guys were very just focused on, you know, getting better as a team. And that's a testament to Coach Lee and the entire staff, um, you know, that's out there and they're doing what they can now with Anchor Collective, um, just starting up and really trying to um, provide those opportunities as well for athletes. And while not being so distracted by putting all your time and effort into trying to, you know, just get yourself out there. So I think that's really good job um, that they're starting that up um, and just kind of, yeah, giving the opportunity for athletes at Vandy. Yeah, and it's and we've seen some great publicity from them from that collective. We've had Jason Burns on pre previously, so and we're going to have the Anchor Collective guys on in the next couple of weeks. But I could see where, without controls in place, and I realize there's a fine line what the university can and cannot do when it comes to NIL money and contracts and and endorsements and those things. But I could see if there's not some control within the team setting, it could create some real animosities and be a real divider within the team. I mean, could you imagine a quarterback or a running back or a tight end making X dollars and the lineman not having any endorsements at all? And then you've got the bickering about, well, why aren't you paying for my dinner and that kind of thing? I know that you talked about the covenants, and I'm hoping that that's part of what's addressed in there, the accountability aspect, but I, I'm sure Coach Lee and the staff are, are addressing that as fast as they can. Um, but do you see that standpoint, from that standpoint, where it could create kind of real issues amongst the team? Um, I think I haven't met all of the you know new guys coming in. Yeah, I met a couple of them. But I think at least from the boys who stayed last year, I think it's a very close-knit group. And I don't think that is something that will come uh, between them, which is really great. And I'm really excited to see what they can do this year and not have that as a distraction. So, Ben, let's take it back onto the field. And I usually don't talk about specific plays and, and games, but you're fresh off your years and playing. So it's a lot more new or in your memory than it is those old guys. Yeah. I want to ask a couple of things. What was your welcome to the SEC moment? Was it a, a practice? Was it a hit? Was it a game, a stadium entrance? Do you remember having one of those memories that, man, I am, I'm in big league football right now and this is SEC, I better buckle up. I'm trying to think. I mean, I, I don't want to sound or, because I so in spring eight, 2018, I came in or, or early enrolled. Mm -hmm. And I was, I guess, my first taste really of it. But then I think maybe turn around on the flip side, it was like I belong here. Like I was making like plays early on freshman year, and I came in with the intent intent to play my freshman year. Um, so I think that was big for me, was just having that confidence coming in. Um, and you know, showing that I belong here. But there was, I knew though that I did have to, you know, for sure put some weight on um, whenever I came in because there was definitely coming back on, you know, split zone blocks and having to seal out some ends. Um, you know, we had some great ends like Andre Mintz and Dio come to mind for sure, Dio Dangbo and having to come across or trying to, you know, double team with at least. And for those of you who don't remember those two guys, they're pro, they're pro players right now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Dio second rounder and Dre, I think is on XFL now too. Yeah. Yeah. So, he is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But both, I mean, both really good guys, really good friends of mine as well. But I think that was going against them was definitely a grind uh, my early years. And just I was like, going to say, it certainly tested not just your physical abilities, but probably a mental abilities as as well and, and you know Ben a lot of people don't talk or don't stress as much about the mental side of, of playing sports in in general it's one thing for you to be just country strong and can move guys and those kind of things but your position is so multifaceted whether you play tight end or a different position in the pros remains to be seen but in coach Lee's offense you're asked to do a lot of things as a tight end 
you could be, I've seen you align you and, and Gavin lined way out or way in your backfield, how uh, you're almost like QB two, if you will. So mm-hmm. I want to, I want to talk about that mental side. And as part of that, the confidence that you have to maintain as an athlete, because you're not just, you know, you get to a certain point, Ben, where you're just reacting. You don't have to think about things. You just know what to do. So mm-hmm. talk a little bit about the mental training aspect of being an athlete, in particular, being a tight end and, and playing for Vanderbilt like that. Yeah, I think one of our strengths last year and why we were in 12 personnel so much, I think I saw a statistic, it was we were third in the FBS, I believe, in percent of 12 personnel. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think our room was... Like, oh, explain 12 personnel to those who don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah. So the first number is number of running backs, so one. Second number is tight end, so two two tight ends in there. That's why you see 10 and 86 on the field at the same time. Yeah, correct. <laughs> but we don't want to see 10 personnel, though. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we, uh, we're we in a lot of 12, and I think that's just a testament to both, like, our tight end room, like, both me and Gav, and also with Justin Ball and Joel DeCourcy just being a very, uh, you know, old and experienced room. I don't want to say old. We're very young, but <laughs> older, more experienced wisdom. Um, so that was definitely huge, and we were able to, you know, it was more whenever we were going through scripts, we already knew because, I mean, at the end of the day, football is football. So it's whenever some of these freshmen or younger guys are still learning like the X's and O's, it's like whenever even with new OC coming in, it's really just all a lot of the same plays, but just new terminology and everything. So you just have to get that down quick. And what really led us to being able to help out the offense, I feel like, and the tight end room was – whenever we would come in with, when we have an install, it would be, we wouldn't have to like go through really each play too much, or we would go through them and we'd like be able to just spot out like two plays that we have questions on and everything else is good. Um, so that really saved us a lot of time. And that on the field, whenever we had Monday night walkthroughs or whatever that was, we were able to know kind of the full concept and help out either tackles or whoever else receivers on what the um, route concept was or what the blocking scheme is. And, as side ends, it definitely is. I, I don't want to take anything away from quarterbacks because that's, I feel like, definitely the hardest position on the field. But I think tight ends, a little biased here, but having to be able to know, like, all assets of the game with, you know, what pass protection it is. Are we in? Are we out on the pass? Is it pass protection? Are we split out? And what, you know, and what does the outside guy have? What's come across on the backside? And then also in all the run game stuff, being able to know and being able to talk with both tackles and with one of our favorite plays from last year. Um, you know, with the, you know, duo game, then we'd have to also help out um, Will, you know, he's over here. I know for guys who I'm living with Will, so I might give him a little, little crap over here. No, but having to help out whenever Will comes in. And, Is he off screen right now? No, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Chef, yeah, whenever uh, they have to motion in and be a part of the run scheme, whenever we're helping out them and who they're going to on the fly. Um, so I think that's just a testament to both, both Coach Stig, Coach uh, – Brendan Flaherty as well, who worked with tight ends, who was our ground assistant as well. And, um, you know, I think just both them and Coach Lee as a whole and Coach Lynch, obviously putting us in great positions to, you know, showcase what we can do and how about the team win in any, any way we can. So, you know, the season is, is so long. It's like 19 or 20 weeks when you add it all together. Mm-hmm. You're almost on autopilot as you get through going through the season. You've done these same plays hundreds of times your muscle memory is intact but that doesn't mean you can slouch on any play Mm -hmm. so toward the end of the season where you get into the Kentucky the Florida the uh, then the Tennessee you know you're late into the season particularly SEC take us into the huddle the plays getting called in you've done this hundreds of times how much actual communication, how much actual talk amongst the, the I'll call you the playmakers, is there as you're breaking huddle and heading up to the line? Are you still talking, hey, watch for the will linebacker what, or whatever? Is there still that communication going on that deep into the season? There is to some extent, um, especially with whenever we're doing game planning and what kind of defensive scheme we're getting and what kind of blitz packages they have. Um, that's the main thing because we know like the base kind of play, but then how does that play look against if there's a corner blitz, if there's a plug inside and how that, if we're going to have any help from the inside or kind of know where help is. And that's the little minute things that we still have to communicate on throughout the year. But for the most part, I mean, 
it does come like at a second nature kind of thing whenever we're getting later on in the year and it's just that is the issue or don't you can't fall to like being kind of just going through the motions either and that's another thing that coach lee i think it was week week four or five it was a little earlier on in the season but he just like said something in meetings and just like bolded it and said every snap matters and like I just wrote it down in my notebook and it really stuck with me and from then on I was just trying to stay present and not just kind of going through the motions and um just after I kind of got that message and really treating it as every snap matters like that's whenever just that consistent good like high level performance really came so that was really great well and it's so true it was so true in the Kentucky game that was a that was a stellar it was it was just such a cold snowy day and you guys really played so well but then the Florida game take us to your touchdown catch because that was I thought that was a special play man that was a fun one and especially because you know Gavin had that earlier uh, touchdown too so I was like all right let's get another one for the boys here and for the tight ends um but really what set it up though was huge momentum from Jalen Mahoney whenever he had that pick and then first play, I was like, all right, let's go right at him. Um, so that was really, I mean, just that momentum of the crowd still being a little amped up from, you know, Jalen's interception was awesome. And then um, coming across and knowing that we practiced that throughout the week. And whenever I kind of was coming across, I saw the flat defender, I was like, oh, shoot. And then I saw Mike kind of scramble out. And I was like, all right, no, if I'm if I'm the shallow runner, I have to get vertical. And it was like, it was in between a little bit, like in vertical. Then I saw Shep coming over on the over. So I like turn and I, I saw Mike, I kind of turned like the little pivot to Mike and luckily he threw me the ball and just made the play after that. So, you know, you make it sound so simple because you've done it a million times. Mm-hmm. And particularly when five is scrambling, you guys, you know, you, it, you're not just a free for all in what you can do. You've got some assignments that you need to kind of follow. But the fact that you caught 14 in the corner of your eye doing what he's doing that lets you know where you needed to be. And that's just what set up the throw and catch and uh, was the difference maker. Guys, I'm talking with number 86, Ben Bresnahan, and he's getting ready for the NFL draft. And I want to talk about that for a little bit because you got a special day coming up, not just my birthday. I'm going to let you have the NFL draft pro day uh, on the 28th of March, but take us into that. What's that day supposed to look like for you? Yeah. So really looking forward to it. It's uh, all the testing and everything. So we're going to have the, uh, bench press um, for 225 we're gonna have the vertical jump the broad jump and then we're gonna go into the 40 yard dash and then the um, 510 five shuttle and then the three cone l drill shuttle um, and then from there we'll go into a um, you know just a list of routes that the scouts want to see from both the quarterback um, who's coming in and then as well as anything else specific they want to see from us tight ends or receivers who are out there um, but right now in training yeah that's been obviously trying to just get those numbers down um, just in the little details, trying to shave off a tenth of a second here, a tenth of a second there. And it's it's a grind. I mean, it's definitely every day in and out. Like, I mean, just literally looking for the exact perfect touch. And that's the thing, too. It's like I'm trying to stay in the moment and, you know, not get too anxious about the moment. And um, But, I'm, you know, all the motions are rolling. I'm so excited for it coming up. I'm so excited, obviously, for your birthday. That's the main reason I'm excited. But uh, <laughs> but excited for the opportunity, but as well anxious. Cause I mean, it's, you know, it's the biggest job interview of our life as well. Um, yeah. so. Well, talk, talk about the, did you attend tight end you this past summer or in the past summers? What's that been like? And for yeah. guys who don't know, does it kind of set the stage a little bit for folks who are not aware of it? Yeah. So tight end you was started by George Kittle. He's with the 49ers now. One of my favorite tight ends, just his whole persona and his whole character and the way he plays the game and both. Dude, you got to get the hair. Come on. We got to get the hair. I know. We got to maybe work on it. I just got a fresh cut last week. <laughs> but uh, we'll maybe grow it out. Um, but yeah, so tight end you, it was uh, really set up by him. And uh, last year or two years ago now, they did it at Lipscomb University and kind of just brought in all the, a lot of the NFL tight ends, um, current ones and um, some past ones as well. And just came in for a little, um, just kind of working out with the boys, um, doing a little um, film study, um, just trying to see ways that they can elevate their game, as well as also hanging out at night on, you know, in Nashville too, and having some fun time with the boys. Um, so a good mix of fun and fun and work. Um, but then this year, they, it was a first year, and I think Jordan Matthews was a big reason too, because his transition to tight end, um, he was able to get in his close relationship with Kittle. Um, he was able to get it at Vandy this year. And that was pretty, pretty sweet because that was, you know, a great opportunity for us uh, tight ends. At least we were able to sneak into the meetings they had. Uh, it was great hearing from uh, Dallas Clark started off um, 
Then we heard from Kittle breaking down some film. And then we heard from Kelsey breaking down some film as well. And it was, it was pretty, pretty spectacular moment. I got all my notes out from it. And it, I mean, it was like just trying to soak everything in I could. And it was, it was a great opportunity. And how cool was it seeing Kelsey and, 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 um, Oh, I'm drawing a blank. The the Eagles tied in who showed out. Oh yeah, Dallas go Derek. Yep. Oh man, those both those guys played so well in the Super Bowl. But yeah. uh, very cool. I know you're you you watch those tight ends like a hawk. Mm -hmm. I know. I was wishing we could get out there and run around with them, but we only could get into the meeting. So I was like, all right, well, we'll take that. <laughs> we'll be out there with you next year. <laughs> ben, we got just a couple more minutes. And and one of the things I always like to to ask is or, or first, my comment is our transition from high school to Vanderbilt is a huge leap. No matter how much of a, a star you were on the field or in the academic world in your high school years, that transition to Vanderbilt academics and SEC football is, is a big one, even for the most accomplished uh, of guys. And, and almost all of us uh, get redshirted along the way because we just need that year of maturity and things. Some of us don't get that luxury because we're needed for our position during the season. But we learn lessons through the whole process. And that, that's what I wanna ask you about this five years at, at Vanderbilt and now getting your advanced degree, you're prepping for the NFL draft and, and hopes that, that you get drafted or sign free agency and hook on with one of the franchises. If you, you're looking back, and I don't know if anybody's asked you to do this at this point with you just as young as you are, Certainly, there's got to be some lessons that you can share for the future Commodores coming up and things that maybe they can learn from your experiences. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say a couple of things. Um, firstly, with um, with thing, another thing, I mean, Coach Lee, has, Coach Lee says a lot of great stuff. So I, I have, we have a full iPad of notes, just pages of it. Um, <laughs> but I think one thing that has really stuck out with me, at least in the last two years, um, is how you do anything is how you do everything and that just is like a testament to I mean the way you get up in the morning uh, to the way you get into the workouts to the way you're eating to the way you're sleeping to the way you're doing extra recovery to the way you're doing academics how you're treating other people like just everything and if your room is a mess I mean sometimes my room I try to keep it clean as possible but uh, if it's a mess like you know sometimes that'll train or kind of filter over into maybe other aspects of your life so I think that's something been something that has really stuck out with me um and then that also kind of goes to another piece where i think just really time management too for the future commodores and coming in and getting your schedule i mean you're going to be drinking through a fire hose whenever you first get here but i mean just being able to really you know take some time to look through your schedule and find those areas where you know you can do like we talked about earlier in this conversation with how to get better as a team and how to get better yourself with the extra recovery, extra film. And however you can find those little pockets of your day to, you know, fill in with that extra growth that you can see both either on the field or in the classroom or, you know, just mentally, emotionally, wherever you need that extra growth in, just find those little pockets to really work on that. Um, I think those are the two main things. And then also, at least through my journey, um, Freshman year, like I said, early enrolled. That first year, I was going to hopefully play a good amount, but then camp uh, tore my ACL back in 2018. So it was not, I mean, that wasn't the plan that God had for me that, at that point to play that early. Um, but I think just for me, at least with my faith too, and just growing my relationship with God and just having that as a really focal point of my life too has been keep, kept me so grounded and just consistent in who I am and who I want continue to want to be. So getting 1% better every day. Mm -hmm every day. Yes, sir. And thank you so much for spending some time sharing your journey. We certainly wish you the very best coming up in the NFL draft. We guys, we got to keep an eye out on number 86 and see how his professional career develops. And we'll certainly be rooting for you, my friend. Yes, sir. Thanks so much for the time tonight. Really appreciate it. Well, it was a lot of fun and a lot of Commodores are rooting for you. Hang on while I sign off. I got a couple things to share. But guys, I've got I've got Commodores coming up every Tuesday. Just check on the list uh, in the group. You'll see what the schedule looks like. Um, thank you for coming this again this, this week, and we'll catch you guys next Tuesday. Hang it down. You're down.